Hello everybody. Today we continue the strategy deep dive series with pawns serving pieces. Pawn play for activating or limiting pieces in chess. Arguably the most important strategic tool that you should improve in your chess because every game will feature this folks. High chance of occurrence. Every game will feature concepts where you play with your pawn to activate your pieces or limit or bury the enemy pieces. So if you actually fundamentally understand this lesson from this video, there's a high chance that you can apply this to your games. This should be the goal of our training, right? We should generally train things that can give us the most benefit. That's the highest chance of occurrence in your actual games. And again, I want you to ask the why questions today to have deeper processing of information so you can transfer this to your games in the future. Remember, we were left with this position from the last episode. After knight d4, bishop takes d4. The question was, how should black recapture this piece? And it's totally about pieces and pawns. And in this case, you have to look at the enemy pieces and you have to find ways to limit them. Okay, so the correct move is c takes d4, folks. And I want you to stop the video right now and ask yourself why this move is the best for black. In other words, what is wrong with e takes d4? <laughs> now we are coming to an interesting moment. What is potentially wrong with this move for black? And for that, I will rotate the board and I will ask you to find the best move for white in this position. Congratulations if you looked at your queen, if you looked at your bishop and you played e5 in this position. Beautiful, activating move. You will form the battery on that long diagonal and the black king is not feeling safe at all in this position. Look at this. It's a beautiful pawn sacrifice and you activated your pieces. You gained coordination and quality on your position. Opposite color bishops favor the attacker in the middle game. Why? Because this battery will attack those light squares, but this guy cannot cover those light squares. So white already has a big advantage in this position. I mean, practically, it's also very advantageous to play with white. It's very difficult to play with black and things have turned. That's exactly why in this position, C takes D was much better for black because right now, right? How can that bishop and queen coordinate? It's impossible. You see, I want you to have a deeper processing. Ask the why question, but go deeper because that's where real learning takes place, right? If you ask yourself this question of why is this move is the best, if you really understand it, then you can transfer it to other tasks. Let's do some retrieval practice, folks. Let's do some space repetition. I've shown you this position before in my previous episodes. Imagine that in this position, black goes b5 and it's white to play. I want you to come up with a plan for white. Again, pawns and pieces. I want you to identify a bad piece for white and please find a way to improve that piece significantly. Congratulations if you looked at your knight on d2. It's a terrible piece. There's no business on that square. So, congratulations if you found the plan f4 followed by knight f3 to e5 and you will create a beautiful beast from that poor knight in two moves, right? This is what I mean by pawns and pieces. Pawns serving pieces, right? That's a fundamental function of pawn play in chess. That's the highest chance of occurrence and this is what I want you to understand, take away from this video, folks. Going back, going back, what should black do in this position? Imagine that black, instead of b5, black has a better move in this position. And now, this is also great, we are actually changing sides, we are looking at it from both directions to have better learning. So it's black to move, folks. I want you to come up with a beautiful multi-purpose move for black that gives black a big positional advantage. Congratulations, it's totally about the enemy plans. We know that white wants to do this, right? So we want to stop that. How do you do that? Beautiful. If you play the move f4, it's a multi-purpose move, not only opening up your bishop, but most importantly, right? You're stopping white plan of f4, knight e3 and knight e5. Thus, this knight on d2 becomes a buried piece. Isn't it beautiful? I made a chessable course about this. The art of multi-purpose moves. F4 is such a beautiful multi-purpose move that improves black's position and also limits and worsens white's position. And now you also understand right, why prophylaxis 
is a very important thing in chess. Stopping the enemy plans can be as powerful as improving your own position. In this case, this was a beautiful plan for white, and black after f4 obtains a big advantage. If white goes g4 here, by the way, let's continue, right? Look at this knight, a terrible piece. Black can go h5 to activate his rooks further on the h file. And now I'll ask you one more question. Imagine it's black to play in this position. My question is this. Should we take on g4 or should we play rook h8? I give you two choices. It's again, it connects to today's episode. Only one move is correct for black. I want you to tell me why and I want you to explain why the other move is wrong. Folks, congratulations if you found the move rook h8. Keeping the tension, not taking on g4 directly and getting ready for potential doubling on the h file, black has beautiful pieces. Look at white pieces. They're on terrible spots. And black obtains an edge in this position. What's wrong with h takes g4? You tell me. How should white recapture folks? It's pawns and pieces, obviously. He will take back with the f1. And suddenly, that knight will become a hero on f3. That knight will significantly improve. That knight on d2 was a terrible piece, right? I want you to pay attention to this in this video, folks, of pawns and pieces. Pawn play always connects to piece activity and restriction in chess. Not only for your own pieces, you should also look at the enemy pieces, folks. And that's a basic message here. Beautiful mistake. H takes g4 only helps white. If you go rook h8, white can say, you know what? I can go here anyways, because if you take my pawn, then comes knight g5 fork and white improves the position, right? He will go king g2 and white has no major problems. Let's apply what we learned today to this example, okay? It's a, it's a game between Spassky and Keres. Here, Keres plays knight b7. I want you to find a good move for white in this position, another multi-purpose move, okay? Congratulations, folks, if you looked at this knight and if you played the move b4. That's exactly what Spassky did. It's pawns and pieces. You're limiting that fianchetto knight on b7. Look how terrible that knight is on b7. Plus, it's a multi-purpose move because you want to also activate your bishop on c2. That's a lovely multi-purpose move. And here, black has only a single chance, only a single move to survive and have an okay position. I will rotate the board for you folks. Imagine that they go b4 against your knight b7 move. And if you give time to white, he will significantly improve his bishop gain full domination on the d5 outpost, your d6 pawn is weak, right? You're facing enormous problems here, like positionally speaking. Just look at how difficult it could be to play this position with black. And in such moments, folks, before it gets too late, you should look at dynamical chances to change the picture. You should look at those fighting moves, even at the cost of a pawn. Always keep your pieces in mind when you sacrifice a pawn, positional pawn sacrifices. That's exactly the move that is good for black. That's the only move for black in this position. Just before it gets too late, he goes d5. And after, well, Keras didn't play this move actually. After he takes d5, the move is knight d6. And obviously, your knight on b7 now gains this beautiful d6 blockading square. Plus, there are ideas like knight c4, knight e4, and black at the cost of a pawn, right? Have good peace activity and compensation. For the pawn that's a beautiful connection to the to this episode folks sometimes you need to bite the bullet and sacrifice the pawn for peace activity and that's most important thing. you should be able to identify your knight is a terrible piece and you should be seeking to take action especially if it's a critical moment for black that's the definition of a critical moment if black slips here then white will play moves like this and you should forget about the move d5 it becomes much more difficult and white obtains a big edge. Let's finish with this example, folks. White's last one was d4, d5, okay? And I want you to come up with a good move for black in this position. And if I give you two choices, do you take on d5 or do you play bishop c5 in this position? Imagine you have two choices. I want you to evaluate and compare those moves and come up with the move that is the only good move in this position. Only one move among these two is good. I want you to also explain to me why one option is bad for us. Okay, take your time. Folks, you're a great player if you played the move bishop c5. And if you rather kept 
the pawn on c6, which is limiting this knight on c3. After takes takes, black has no problems. No one can attack this knight on c5. And importantly, that pawn on c6 is limiting that knight on c3. If white takes on c6, that will be a bad move because after b takes, many players, by the way, would say, oh, I'm creating a weakness on c6. I don't like it. I don't want to create a weakness on c6, but they refuse to look at the function of that pawn. The function of that pawn is to bury and limit that knight on c3. We are not giving away an outpost to white for no reason, right? So I want you to now perceive your c6 pawn as a great asset in your position rather than a weakness that could be targeted, right? That's the final function of this training, that you will change your perception about your pawns and pieces. You will always prioritize piece activity and restriction when it comes to pawn play. If you go back to the initial position, if you take on d5, that would be a blunder. You see, it's a positional blunder because you're giving away this d5 outpost for free. You're giving away also squares like this to white pieces, knight b5, knight d5s are coming in the future. And here, it's a much more difficult position to play for black, this one. You are facing enormous difficulties if you simply take on d5, folks. Yes, there is no more weakness on c6, but, well, this is also hanging. This knight is, is, is a beautiful piece. Rook d1s are coming. This is loose, right? Just look at the drawback of this move, folks. Okay? So going back to this position, that comes from a Slav defense, by the way. That's a typical idea in the Slav that d6, c6 pawn is a big, big tool for you, big asset for you in this position. And you don't want to give it away for no reason. And finally, a homework position to finish this lesson. It's a beautiful game of Vasily Smyslov with white pieces. I want you to find a great positional move for white in this position. Try to apply what you learned in this lesson and please comment on YouTube. I will give you feedback and we will take it from there. Thanks again for today, folks. For further information, you can ch check my chessable courses. The Art of Awakening Pieces and the Art of Burying Pieces touches those top subjects. I will delve more into those topics in my future episode of the series Chess Strategy Deep Dive. Please give me a like and subscribe if you like this video so we can reach more people and I will catch you on the next episode. Thank you, folks.